thought I'd open it up. Why don't we go ahead and open it up for people? Do does anyone, does anyone have a question? Martine, where, where are you? You had a question earlier. Yeah. So. I was very curious about the uh, first presentation um, about the uh, Jewish community in Spain. I mean, I understand how it works now, but how do you deal with the projects, let's say, of 15 years ago in a digital way, I mean? That's one part of the question. And are you sure you could you know, keep, let's say, the way you archive now a project within this big model or any other model? In 20 years' time, are you sure you can access the material still? Are you upgrading the systems of filter in a constant or Clear box, I mean, put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, in fairness, right, right, absolutely, what can you um, say? Yeah. Uh, in terms of our experience on King's Cross, this issue of, uh, of the kind of the, the degradation of the data, if you like, digital data, hasn't really been an issue, actually, funnily enough. Um, well, because it's a very uh, recent, recent project. In the yeah. World, so not, oh, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. I'm not uh, pretty, yeah. but let's say in 20 years, I'm yeah. able to still access that material, because that's just something that's for museums and collections yeah. is a big problem. Uh, well, I, I mean, the answer is I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. um, that's uh, right. That's what most of us are saying. We yeah. don't. Um, yeah. In terms of format of the, I mean, what's 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 important in our in our digital archive, if you want to call it that, in terms of our work, is the structure and how those files combine and relate to each other in sure. the managed environment. And to do that, we need to have you need to understand the environment, you need to understand the workspace, you need to, and the, the software used to get in there has to... And do you, have, do you, are you standardized in the software that you use? Yes, I mean, we, 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 we have uh, developed our workspace over right. the past 10 years, right. consistently on a single platform, um, <coughs> with, uh, with that aim in mind, actually. So, for instance, uh, files that we produce on day one, using our software on because we can open them using our software today, and we can reference them. Everything. So also the very early project of the office we're able to open. So the material from '97. How how accessible is that, honestly? That's still uh, that's still vetted, and we, we can we can open that, we can manipulate it, and we can present it. Okay. Do that. Prior to that, I'm going to come. I I will actually hold my hand up. I mean, since the introduction of of the software, we've never changed platform. So that would have been around the, the late 90s. And this, uh, this from Robert's introduction is, is way before my time. It's kind of a similar experience to, uh, to any practice, I think. Those kind, of, um, those kind of methodologies, those kind of digital tools were kind of becoming part of our work. Right, sure. Um, however, I know absolutely that uh, uh, using the platform configuration that we've got, I can access any file that we have ever produced using our, using our, using our platform uh, today, using the software we've got. So there's, no, there's actually no issue. I mean, it will be dumb with data, for sure. Sure. Um, but there's no, there's no problem with actually accessing it. In terms of how that, how that will, will develop, uh, well, there's a big challenge for architects at the moment. I mean, uh, we, we're using proprietary tools you know, to, 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 to access this information. And, um, uh, and that's quite a harsh environment for us to exist in. You know, the, the, there's a, there's a, there's, we could say there's a battle going on right there. Yeah. So to, 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 uh, I, I think various vendors want to become kind of ubiquitous and, 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 and want to own that market. Well, that, that's kind of destructive to our work. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know how that will develop. I don't know whether that anyone else wants to. I think it's, we've had a similar experience um, with using BIM technology when we worked on a project. Uh, using digital projects, the, the, the software that Frank Gehry's team developed from Katia. It's very interesting because the, the modeling that you're doing is not necessarily geometry based, but it's timeline based. It's based on a series of processes that in future versions might not be applicable. So you don't know whether the version you're using in five years will still be using those processes. So those, that, those files that you had five years ago would even open. As you said, it's proprietary based. So unless you keep that software, you're not necessarily containing data, you're containing history, you're containing timelines. Yeah. So any piece of geometry is only there because it knows how it was made, rather than just being curves and meshes, and it's not actually there as geometry, it's there as history. It's very weird, and, and unless you do keep up to date with those iterations and, 
as the, the software develops, you can find that software, that, that file is simply no longer accessible at all. I mean, you can get that on a simple software like InDesign. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're making you're working on a presentation, it only opens two editions. So if you have, I imagine if, you, if you're working on a presentation that you make on InDesign CS2, you probably can't open that anymore. Mm -hmm. if, if you're working now on, on say, you can only open the PDF. And again, based on the functionality of the software, yeah. because the, those, pro, those tools have either changed or they just simply well, didn't exist before. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure this came up yesterday, but for, as, as museum curators, the big challenge is how you create a, sort of a universal tool to present this material to visitors. So rather than just only one of your drawings, how can you kind of kick proof your hardware and your software to make sure there's a kind of universal view of some sort, whether it's a PDF or native uh, design file? You need to be secure in the knowledge that. I mean, you can kind of keep up to date and, and things will suddenly become inaccessible in a study room or they, you know, files might suddenly become corrupted or you can't keep up with, uh, you know, if, if, if design is moving forward faster than the sort of study room resources or the museum archive and resources, then mm -hmm. you'll never be able to keep up. Actually, That's big, William D. This is William Kilbride from the Digital Preservation Coalition. Yeah. I thought maybe you've been here both days. So do you have any comments? Well, yeah, so I mean, I, I think... I mean, there's a range of different themes that can unpick here. So I'm interested in the idea of the environment. I think that's a very important observation. Again, I said this yesterday, but my, my sense is that archive, archives have viewed this as a file problem, but increasingly you become aware of the dependencies on a range of different, this is technology stack problem. And whereas in the past we've thought, well, we could save these files with PDFs or CAD, Actually, it's the interdependencies between those types of technologies that really begins to matter. So the libraries that the CAD the files is a place to start, but it's not by all means a place where it ends. And depending on, it's, it's almost like, as you rightly observed, there's an ongoing technology, and you are, in effect, curating the collection as you go, and you know it's doing all those change updates, and that's the way it has to be. Uh, the question arises is how easy is that to transfer to a memory institution, how easy is that to, to make available to someone else for them to curate after the fact? You know? mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to that, and that's an interesting, I guess that's and why also you have to understand made. from our perspective as traditional archivists, <coughs> the notion of altering the records that we receive was not the way we were taught. So this yeah. is a new thinking, and unfortunately that my colleague Eugene Daniels from the National Gallery of Art, who was here yesterday, who is a trained archivist from the old school, has gotten that message. And so the notion of how we work through maintaining, and Martine, as we talked about this, the traditional notion was that you maintain and respect the original order, the integrity of the archives that comes to you. And in the digital world, we still want to be able to bring that to the table, but yet the reality is, in order for, you, for anyone, I think, I didn't say this yesterday, but I think actually future researchers are gonna be recurating yeah, the thing I, we curated. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I mentioned the kind of very unique experience of sitting with Neil in front of a workstation, Absolutely. and I thought, wouldn't it be great if a future visitor could actually enjoy that experience of reconfiguring, not necessarily redesigning, but just to kind of understand, um, you know, other layers that you could add to the raw data to show different view or different flight, you know, curate your own um, animated flight through, for example, well, so you have the raw you data. Your you design, your design at that moment, what you created. In the traditional, how did we capture that before? Because we really yeah, didn't. The output really, was an exhibition yeah. catalog and installation yeah. shots. But the point is, what you've got are actually records yeah. that show the creative yeah. process. So somebody's going to use and that. And in theory, in 20 years' time, you could recreate the recreate recreate the design and recurate it. In fact, because all the raw 3D um, sort of then inventory is there already. So well, one one interesting point on this on this may be the fact that you know at the emergent emergent level of tools that we're starting to see and we're starting to adopt. Uh, what's the status of a file? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a piece of code that uh, can be used in an, optimization, an optimization routine for an architectural problem using a genetic algorithm, for example, which embeds in it some kind of stochastic process. So the, the, the design of the code is one, is one act. The, the, the running of the, of the script is another act. And every time it runs, uh, it's unpredictable, actually. And, uh, and, and therefore, there's, no, there's not that link in the, the mm. you know, we have the archive of the original design. Um, I mean, these, and actually, these, these sort of tools have actually been 
although they're emergent and when we're, we're still as architects not comfortable using them, uh, they, they have been, I mean, they were, they were, they were embedded in sort of proprietary bits of software five years, five, oh, five years ago in some, in Ecotech, for example, which was uh, environmental analysis software. That was running, um, that was running uh, genetic algorithms in ways that we didn't even understand when we pressed when we pressed the button. You know, but you're really speaking a language that I, I hear, mm. and I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if you're, if you're, if you're, as long as you're not experimenting, let's say, with the software, not pushing forward, yeah. I'm not sure about the two, the other two, let's say, you just follow the rules of the software that you get the you use, I don't think there is much of a problem. It gets very problematic for archives and collections with uh, projects where architects were really experimenting with, with the software and what we are facing now with the CCA, right. mm -hmm. that Chuck Holman labels as a code which is unreadable for anyone, even he cannot open the code anymore. <laughs> so let's say it's very, because it was just, you know, experimenting using illegal software to then rewrite illegally the software. So <laughs> then it comes yeah. that as long as you kind of follow the um, uh, standards and normal, normalization mm -hmm. of the process, mm -hmm. it's fairly doable. But I think the other thing that Martina brought up yesterday is that um, another really important component to this is the nature in which the, the process in which the records are created. So the whole way of how the office works, the tracking of the creative process. It, traditionally, in, in traditional paper architectural records, you couldn't capture that because it was an intellectual process based on people personally meeting now with the platforms, there are email chains, there's all these other kinds of things that potentially could be saved as a part of the archives to contribute to the complete understanding of the creative process. In other words, it's interesting because with what you're creating, we have the potential to really, we can save everything. But the question becomes, if we do that, I think for me the challenge is, how do we ensure that the selection is made around rationales that are feasible for being able to ensure that portions remain accessible for a longer period of time? And Martine was suggesting that they've actually done oral histories. They've done oral interviews with some of the staff to capture that process that may still not be ca capturable through you know, the, the, even these new digital methods. And it's something that I, we should be exploring at, at Reba because it's a very important additional element um, when I when I hear your interest in the codes and everything is, is brilliant because one of the things that you, you articulated that is so important is that it's what David was saying, the VNA respect required a paper printout of that drawing because in our world we still haven't made the yeah. complete and transition to data itself exactly. and having value. And, and our challenge yeah. is, you know, if you we could be waiting twenty years until there's an ideal solution, but then you know we may not be able to access David and Kevin, and we may not be able to get that. So we, it's not it's not at all satisfactory. And it is a funny thing to be creating this kind of um, sort of mirror image of a, a design process, but it's at least something, and we can and it's it's the best we can do right now, Absolutely. unfortunately. Yeah. And I wish it was different, but that's just the situation we're in. Yeah. So can, can I make an observation, which may be actually rather aimed at the people behind me, rather than the panel of the <laughs> So we have a traditional view of an archive, and this is true of broadcast, it's true of architecture, it's true of government, it's true of all sorts of sectors where, you know, the archive kind of comes at the end of the process somehow, and there's some sort of a process where we manage the files that come out at the end of a project, and the archive is at the end of a workflow in some sense. But actually, everything you've described, I mean, the, the cloud is a great example of that, where in a sense the archive now sits in the middle of the organisation. The archive actually now sits in the middle of the workflow rather than being something which is produced afterwards. And that's certainly true of, of broadcast. It's certainly true of other sectors now. You see, actually, the important thing is curating the archive at the centre of the organisational function rather than as a byproduct of something that the, the organisation does. And that points to the need for a great deal of reintegration of the archives profession into the professions with whom they work, practice. with into practice. And I know, I mean, I, if I remember correctly, your own descriptions of King's Cross talking directly with you know the project as it practice has been a beneficial uh, experience. I think many of the problems made, uh, Martin, you were describing yesterday come from the fact that these are effectively archaeological projects. These yeah. are uh, going back over the remnants that were there and are difficult to understand. So the challenge for the art, I mean there's a challenge here for the archives profession I think is about how do we, or how does the archive, not an archivist, it's easy for me to poke like this, but you know, how do archivists engage 
with such a, and it's going to be true of so many sectors, not just architecture, but architecture presents its own specific issues and face them. But Thomas, what are the leftovers for the DNA of the exhibition? I mean, what did you acquire? Did you yeah, acquire well, points, well um, as I said, we, I mean, apart from the, um, I mean, you describe it, Cliff, as collateral, but um, we, we kind of say ephemera, but we did acquire some ephemera, and in fact, I need to, I don't know if Christopher's, <laughs> is, 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 is Christopher still here? Right. Um, but Christopher Marston, who's our um, chief, uh, senior archivist, I need to actually give him a whole load of stuff that I still have from the exhibition. But, but what do you yeah. have? But just, just here, like, um, <laughs> yeah, it's like the exhibition guy, phys physical, but the problem is we didn't acquire anything digitally. And, um, and we could acquire some of those screen grabs, but in a way it's... But you would not it's, acquire, let's say, the whole uh, design of the exhibition, for example, or you would not... I mean, we, we do, I, I mean, again, this would be something for Christopher to answer, but I don't think we have a strategy to acquire the entire design of an exhibition. We may acquire some of the presentation, the design reports at various design stages, but we don't have any strategy, really, of, apart from screen, you know, installation shots, things like that, but I don't think we have a strategy of acquiring okay, now, design, uh, which is interesting, and especially with this, it would have been a good chance to acquire. The gentleman here on the structure. Um, keep, uh, I'm actually going to be new characters, but I am an archaeologist by background, but... Fascinating stuff, very interesting about the King's Cross and your ideas of stuff going and developing parts of plans that maybe never materialised, but whether you've kept kind of phases of bits that may have materialised. But my, my, that sort of leads on to the question, which is for what and, and perhaps some criteria for how you manage the process is, is, is what we're focusing a lot on is reuse. And I, what I'm wondering from yesterday is what people feel about in terms of in, in your particular area, rather than mine in our but in, in your area, what potential there is for people to reuse the stuff in the future, because that really makes a big criteria for what you think is important to hand on as a kind of legacy to anyone. <laughs> well, I, th I mean, I think it goes back to what you were saying before about it's not necessarily the, the importance of the files, the importance of the library and, and how that library is maintained, because these files are only su as successful as the links between them. And so when you produce this data, you know, in most softwares there are ways of packaging this up and, and publishing it so you can put them into folders where all these li files, no matter where they move to, will, will maintain those connections. So when you open up, you can successfully keep them together and, and reuse that information. Otherwise, it's just disparate numbers of, of what that file actually represents and you'll, you'll never kind of piece it together again. I mean, this, this is really going towards the, the heart of a major challenge for, for us as architects at the moment being faced with. I mean, uh, this, this kind of acronym, BIM, is, is around. And, um, no one knows what it is. <laughs> no one knows what it is. I'm really well, you sure had, you had, no, I can tell you what I think it, it, it is. I, I, uh, obviously, you, you had the first day yesterday. Uh, yeah. Maybe you covered this in, in a lot more kind of detail and sophistication than I can. Uh, but it is a challenge to us, and it goes back to the heart of actually what, what are we, what are we modelling, what are we drawing, what are, how are we, how are we specifying that, that that data, and who's it for ultimately, uh, and and. And our understanding of, of, of the idea of, of, uh, of producing much more sophisticated models is that actually we need to understand that process, which is not just our involvement in the project, uh, which, which comes in the commission for a project and then the construction phase usually, but actually the whole briefing pro process from the client, the user, and then handing it on to people who are going to use it. And actually the whole government BIM strategy, government soft landings, all that kind of stuff, is actually aimed at understanding uh, and building in those 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 uh, those kind of uh, linkages in the libraries, I'm saying, from day one of the project, so that, that is handed on for uh, for, for for owners and, and, and users of, of whatever asset it is that we're, we're, we're modeling. And, in, in which, and, and at that point, of course, this idea of the the digital really then you know sort of becomes it is pure representation of that digital ground that, that it may result in drawings and 3D models as far as the architect's concerned but it will dissolve into a kind of field of spreadsheets and, and, other, and other curated data types for whoever's going to operate and, and, and manage and, uh, and, uh, and, and use the, the, these assets so I'm not sure whether that was actually exactly your <laughs> question but I mean, Kent, you have something? Hi, as I'm Kent from the RIBA, I've got a comment and a question. Um, the comment is just a, an irony that I keep going, keeps going around in my head is that with 
that kind of the nature of, of the last few days is to be to focus on the digital. Um, and the more we've done that, the more that, that has seemed to sort of dissolve in terms of meaning on files, into networks and connections. Um, but the irony it seems to me is that at the end of the day, the core product of everything could not be more physical. Um, <laughs> and so is creating the physic the biggest physical and analog things in our digital in our so in our physical environment. Um, so just keeping that in mind, I found it interesting. Um, but then my question is very different from that, um, which is that all of you, and it sort of builds on William's point, um, which is that all of you talk to a certain extent about the extent to which you're archiving at the moment. Sometimes archiving meaning just storing, and sometimes archiving meaning creating a historical record and thinking about the significance. Um, and then you, you all also touch on the way to the extent to which you're starting to curate your own collections and will have challenges about it. And I just wondered if you could all just maybe comment a bit, especially about the latter, which is about using the archive that you already have within your own practices to talk about, reflect, tell stories, um, reconsider and sort of reflect on your practices, both internally but also sort of externally in the wider world. Well, I mean, I, I, I would say it's interesting that, I mean, do, do you guys think that in the future the, the point of practices need to archive stuff will become increasingly redundant? Because if, I mean, I guess you, you archive because you have too much stuff, but I mean, if, 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 if there's no limit on the amount of stuff that you can store, I mean, the, the archive could become sort of the file structure so that the need to kind of actually do this process of kind of archiving things is what, I mean, what, what is it what is, does it need anymore it's it's we're becoming more and more selective about what we archive whether it's both in both its digital form and its uh, physical form mainly because of storage and and if that's that our digital storage you know being very very harsh on what parts of the design process we intend to keep because which actually will you ever reference again and and reuse again and for us it's it's only useful I guess if it's there for display purposes or, or part of our design process. So say it's a particular script you wrote or a particular piece of geometry that you think that would be really relevant again uh, and we might bring it up in another design process but 95% of the time that will never be reused and in fact it's sometimes quicker to redraw it again or, yeah. or rewrite that script again because the parameters have changed or it's, you know, so I, I keep all of these files like, oh, that will be really, really useful again but they've been so specific to produce the window design on something or other. Do you think that so pressure of storage, is, I mean, I would say that increasingly you, we can keep everything, digitally anyway, because I, I'm not sure there's going to be, I mean, yeah. we, we don't, we don't, we just keep everything. I mean, because yeah, I mean, it, cloud, cloud storage it's, un, it's, it's unlimited, unlimited, unlimited storage and I guess as the kind of technology increases, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually interested in, in Neil, the way you work. You mentioned that you're scripting away. I'm wondering when you're doing that scripting, is that software dependent or is it independent? And I'm thinking in the future, could somebody get that piece of code and reproduce what you had done? Uh, not, and if not, are you worried about how ephemeral it can become? Or? Uh, yes and no. I, generally, it is software dependent. It, it can be related. So in, in the Rhinoceros, the 3D software we use, it's a uh, plugin called Grasshopper, which is this wonderful, uh, I say, idiot's guide to scripting because I do not understand a lot of code and it's a very visual way of understanding these elements. But as I said, sometimes we, you feel like it's very important to keep hold of these things. But equally, sometimes it's a lot quicker to just redo it again and rewrite that code and, and spend another day just repurposing that together. So I think as, as, there's a lot of people in the studio who get very worried and they, they will save iterations of files like every hour and then create another 100 megabytes of data, another 100 megabytes of data. I'm very much a policeman in the studio and going around and making sure this doesn't happen. <laughs> deleting. Uh, <laughs> deleting and, and knowing when to supersede data and, and how to compress it and archive it because very quickly in the studio of, of over 100 people, you can use up the, the server in a second. And but if knowing... Have, if you don't have a server, that's not a problem. Mm. It's yeah. true, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I think we just have to be very careful about when it's relevant to create that new file and when it's relevant to actually delete data and, and, and being okay about it. Because the end result is, as we've been talking about, you know, the, the end result is this physical object. And that's what we're always trying to get to. And I think. It's, it's being non-sentimental about, let's say, the process that led up to kind of creating it, but understanding where those milestones 
Ah, uh, to document. Neil, actually, the plane had Yeah, I just want to follow up the question really about uh, keeping stuff. And about, it's a question really, but I'm sure it'll lead to some discussion. I think with the capacity, for example, cloud storage, it's a good example because when we have cloud storage, we have kind of this elastic capacity to store stuff and it looks infinite and it's very attractive from that perspective. And when you look back at old projects, you realize actually they're really, they're really slim, they're really narrow, there's actually not much there. And that's partly because actually we weren't that creative with stuff, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And I wonder whether the capacity, the fact that we can store a great deal more means that actually we're much more prone to what was yesterday referred to as data bloat, mm. that we can just, because we can, yeah. we just do create a lot more. And whether that's a it's not a healthy but, but, place to be. But then I think, the, the, I think the, there will be a point where the power of search will override any kind of yeah, exactly. problem we have with file. You know, if we, if we, because there's a point in which the, the time it takes to look through a kind of carefully curated file structure is actually obliterated by the fact that if search is search you can find any, you can actually archive yeah, yeah. everything in one but, massive cloud. But, and you, if you can search in a specific thing, that's fine. The observation is surely that, 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 that as, storage in, uh, as storage gets cheaper, search becomes more expensive too. So the, the complexity of searching in the data set becomes equally, is also on a parallel growth track. And there's, there's statistics from well, I think it's from Oracle, but you would, they would say that, wouldn't they? <laughs> uh, I'm sure that there's 80 percent of unused data that resides in Oracle databases, which slows down processes and makes mm -hmm. data retrieval produces lots of false positives. Yeah. But there's another side to that as well. So you can store everything, but what's the point of that if it's by this time you can't access it? But actually, but the, the cost of curating data isn't about storing it. It's about intervene to make sure that it's accessible into the long well, And that's well, a major problem. And if, if we go down this alleyway of discussing, shall we just keep everything, there's, there's really little point of doing that because there's absolutely no way that anybody in this room has the resources to do that. Not, not the private institutions that are creating the archives or ourselves. And one of the kind of things that I think is the elephant in the room here is that we have a massive challenge to tackle in terms of digitally archiving and thinking about curating this, but we're all I'm sure, in a position where our, our budgets are being massively attacked. And one of the things that people in a challenging economic time think we can do without is properly resourcing cultural heritage institutions. So but I think, I think that's where the cloud, the, that's where the, surely that's where the cloud comes in, because if, you can, if we can think of a future where we're actually on the cloud sharing our servers and our that's where the cost saving comes in, surely. We're not thinking, well, we're, we're moving right. Yes, you know, a presentation was very interesting by the, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, the archaeologist. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he explained, he had a, he had a very nice uh, diagram saying, let's say, we all thought in museum and collection world that storage would be, would be eventually very expensive, or well, now it turns out it's very cheap actually compared to our uh, ideas, let's say, 20 years ago on the digital. But what is this, yeah. what is, will keep on being expensive is labor. You know, just people that can actually work with these uh, kinds of files and understand it and yeah. just search it. So in the end, I think you're right. Um, yeah. It's not, I mean, it might be, it can be a shared responsibility because of the cloud and everything and so on. Yeah. But at the same time, at the end of the day, um, someone needs to pay for this uh, sharing or for the labor that but, but is that not where this, if, if search algorithms can be good enough, why do you need labor? I don't see where the labor, the little requirement for labor. It's not what? access. Documenting the, the object, making sure that when you have a very complex set of data, that it's being stored in a way that makes it accessible in the world, like the buildings we're talking about, that if you need to migrate that into a new format so that it maintains its accessibility, right. that you can know whether or not that is lost significant properties so that, for example, your building isn't 10 millimeters off, and that means that any of the work that you do on that data set could lead to some kind of catastrophic failure. It's that kind of very close up interaction where the costs are. Well, that's so also just in the traditional archival world, the things of enduring value had to have not only the original order, but authenticity. You needed to be able to verify where they came from. One of the things I want to just mention to all of you is that you are still living in a world where liability issues exist when structure is done. In the digital world, how are you going to be able to necessarily prove, provide the evidence? This is another thing that we've got to think about. If you're getting rid of stuff, that's fine, and actually selection is important. 
Are you ensuring that you have some sort of outline for what the key legal requirements are for a particular project? I'm, just, I'm sure you do. But I'm just saying it's 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 a right, no, no, no. <laughs> 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 And it is, it is it, until we get rid of the, the concept of legal liability, and in fact, I don't think that the really interesting thing is I don't think they've figured out yet <laughs> what the digital will bring to something like legal, legal liability. And so, from my perspective as an, as an archivist, I'm, you're naturally quite scared to take records that are within liability without making sure that the office is aware that there is this liability. So if we make a selection of things, the other stuff we didn't take, don't get rid of it until the period of when it might be needed is over. I mean, these are, this is just one little issue, but it is a tremendously important thing to be thinking about in terms of the ongoing practice needs and what have you. But can you I just, um, in a way, it's all about selecting what's, my point really with Abraham was that the ability to search isn't the same as, the, as what's significant. Um, and, but obviously the two sides of the same coin, but what's significant, say for example, in terms of sort of legal responsibility, but also what's significant in terms of the creative process, I think is a real issue with respect to data flow. Um, so in the past, the reason why archives were so much smaller, um, both digitally and in analog form, is people were making choices, um, much like um, David did too, um, still is now, about what he can afford to keep and what he thinks is really significant. Um, but with the ability to keep everything, that choice about what's significant is increasingly diminishing. And there was, I thought there was a really interesting sort of moment today when Neil was sort of pointing at the slide, and he said, you've got all these data, but it's these two reports here that are basically really exciting mostly because they capture this moment in a project. Um, and it's how we capture that sense of what architects and their practice <coughs> feel are significant within their archives that I think at the moment we're not really addressing. And that's a different part of our having. I think that's part of the need to start our, to be asking um, practices to be archiving in a more sophisticated way and starting to create their own archive. Mm -hmm. yes. um, or, or as with the case of the King's Cross, you, there was a kind of sense of stewardship before the project even finished to right. work alongside Absolutely. designers and, to, and to, to, try to share and what is important the because there are going to be conflicts of what who thinks what's important. Absolutely. And then actually, people outside this room will think completely different things are important in fifty years' time, and we may have decided to, you know, as, a, as a community to edit these things out. And who well, knows? that's going to be a, that's a problem with yeah. the analog. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That, that, that was the yeah. same way in the paper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the point is, and, and what we're in the situation now with the archival profession, which again, the archival profession itself is less than, what, 200 years old, really, in terms of codifications. And one of the things that has become really important in the digital world now is to document the choices that were made about records. Mm -hmm. That's part of the, it's not part of the metadata, but it's the new provenance. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is part of our process in working with the McCasm offices that we want to document. I want to make sure that we know what there is, work with the office to make a selection, make it clear that don't get rid of the stuff that we don't take because you've got your liability issues. And then potentially, maybe in five years' time, maybe in 10 years' time, the stuff that we took, might we might be aware that we would want to take more in a different context. So I think we should be open to that. It's not, I mean, in the digital, the other thing is, it's not like the paper world where you used to have an office closed and something got the dump truck. We've got, the digital is an issue in terms of not being able to access things after five years necessarily, but we've also got in some ways the ability to take in later additions that could become apparent based on the initial selection, the criteria, but then perhaps even the users. So this is another way of thinking about curating. When we start, because we do this in the paper world, we get a whole spate of access issues around something where we never thought about that. And so we're potentially gonna get that in the digital world with our digital records, and we're probably going to get people saying, why did you have this, or why did you have that? So it would be a great way to kind of use that as well as a way to augment the initial selection. And I hope maybe we can do this in the digital world. I think in a way, this is trying to get away from, what uh, Kent is right, I mean, these are always, always, everything I've ever attended, these kinds of conferences, you've got on the one hand the absolutely incredible potential of the new technology and how it's being continuously embraced, developed, and pushed further by the design profession. And on the other hand, you have us as the archivists, as the records managers, still trying to articulate how we capture and ensure that we can make available beyond 10 years or 15 years 
this information that's being created. And I think it's, it's still an ongoing challenge. And I think in, in way of a wrap up today, because I want the office to be able to allow our tours, I'm really grateful to all of you for coming together here and asking these questions. I think somebody said yesterday, did you find out any answers? I'm not sure. I think we're still, I think we, 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 the issues are very apparent. Um, but I am just so grateful to everyone that's been involved for sharing their expertise and bringing this together in this kind of a forum, because this is really the way to continue the dialogue and also to get what the next outcomes and steps will be. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope everyone will now enjoy the tour of the McCasin office. Thank you.